graphs. Graphs are fascinating data structures that we use to model interconnected data. Graphs capture relationships between items, they capture affinities, uh, they capture interactions. We use graphs in many domains, like machine learning, predictive analytics, recommender systems. In fact, you use graphs uh, every day when you use applications. For example, if you follow someone on Twitter, you add an edge to a social graph. If you searched how to come here on your Google Maps app, you run a shortest path query. If you found a celebrity or politician from your country in the Panama Papers leak, well, <laughs> this data was actually um, mined using graph technology. There's a lot of graph technologies out there, but today I want to talk about distributed graph processing. Why distributed graph processing? Um, the most common answer I get to this question is the following. I have such a massive graph, it doesn't fit in a single machine, so I need to use more than one machine. Um, do you really have such big graphs? <laughs> Take, for example, Twitter. Twitter runs its who to follow service on a single machine, and they actually need just 64 gigabytes of memory to represent a graph of 2 billion users. I'm quite sure you don't have 2 billion users, right? <laughs> However, if you've used graph analysis, you know that the size of the input data set is usually not the most important thing. It's not what defines whether you need distributed uh, graph processing or not. What really matters is intermediate data. Because in graph applications, state can explode really fast. For example, in a who to follow naive version, we have to compute extended neighborhoods of a node. So even for a, for a node with just few neighbors, the state explodes fast. The second answer that people give on why do we need distributed or when do we need distributed graph processing is that, you know, distributed is always faster than single node, right? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of research that says that's not always true. However, this research sometimes fails to take into consideration that in real life, graphs just don't appear out of thin air. If this is your expectation, well, get prepared for reality, because you probably have distributed data sources, and you have to receive the data, clean it, create your graph, and then process it as just one of the many steps of your data processing pipeline. So in real life, your data might already be distributed, right? Now, once you have decided that, yes, this is what I need, I need distributed graph processing, you have to start writing your application. But how do we express a distributed graph processing application? Writing distributed programs, it's inherently hard. But writing graph programs, it's even worse. Because graph applications are very, very diverse and have very different requirements. So by saying I do graph processing, you might mean I do iterative value propagation, like page rank. Or you might refer to graph traversals, a very different pattern. Or ego network analysis or pattern mining, finding subgraphs. These are all very, very different categories of applications. Now, we have tools to write these applications. So let's, let's go through um, the recent graph processing history, starting, of course, in 2004. What happened in 2004? No? MapReduce. <laughs> MapReduce changed everything, right? So MapReduce inspired similar high-level abstractions in many domains, including graph processing. Of course, someone tried to use MapReduce for graph processing. 
One of the first systems that did that was Pegasus in 2009. Um, they did graph processing with a two-stage MapReduce job. Of course, going through the file system after every iteration didn't work very well. So a year later, Google publishes the Pregel paper that introduces the vertex-centric uh, abstraction for graph processing. On the same year, Signal Collect is published, which introduces a quite similar abstraction. And, the, and two years later, Power Graph. Now, these three all target the same category of applications. They all target iterative value propagation algorithms. So let's see what's the idea here. The Pregel idea was think like a vertex. In the spirit of MapReduce, you write a single user-defined function that is executed per vertex in the graph. So every vertex has access to an inbox of messages to the neighbors and produces messages for other vertices. Computation proceeds in synchronized iterations called super steps. During a super step, its vertex execute the, executes the compute function and produces the new vertex value and sends messages to the other vertices. For example, you could write page rank in this model like this. First, a vertex goes through the messages and sums them up, then sets the new vertex value, and finally redistributes the rank to the neighbors. Signal Collect, the second system, did something very similar, but splits the super step in two phases. So basically, it decouples sending messages from updating the vertex value. So during the first phase, let's see again page rank. During signal, a vertex sends the, the rank to the neighbors. And during collect, it goes through received messages and updates the vertex value. And the third one, Power Graph, introduced this gather some apply model, which splits a super step into three phases. The main difference here is that the first phase is parallelized over the edges, not the vertices. So for every edge, you compute a partial value. Then you combine the values in the sum phase, and finally use the last phase, phase to update the vertex value. Page rank again. In the gather phase, every edge computes a partial rank. In the sum phase, the ranks are combined to a single value, and in the last apply phase, the ranks are updated. Right after um, Power Graph in 2013, Giraffe++ introduced a model called Think Like a Graph. Actually, the paper is called from Think Like a Vertex to Think Like a Graph. The idea here is that instead of applying the compute function per single, ver single vertex, why not let the compute function access the state of the whole partition, right? So this is a good idea because it lets information flow freely inside the partition, and it significantly reduces communication. So this system proves to be quite good for graph traversal algorithms. The trend continues uh, with N-Scale that does neighborhood-centric computation. So think like a neighborhood. <laughs> so you can apply a compute function on custom neighborhoods of vertices. That's very good for ego network analysis applications. And in 2015, Arabesque introduces think like an embedding. Um, this is uh, a model for pattern matching in graphs. So you can produce subgraphs, enumerate subgraphs, and do like graph mining applications. Mm -hmm. On the same year, Tinkerpop introduces a language for graph traversals. Now, um, there are many systems that I haven't mentioned, very notable systems. And it seems to me, I have a feeling that we'll keep on developing more and more systems 
for graph processing. And why not? Um, actually, this, I found this tweet uh, to describe perfectly both my feelings about it and <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we cannot help it, right? We want yet another <laughs> graph system. <laughs> but my vision is that we need a graph system that can, um, can offer multiple of these abstractions. So first we need something that integrates well in a data pipeline. So something that is built on top of some distributed processing engine. We need good tools for graph uh, extraction and transformation because graphs just don't appear out of nowhere. And we need to have familiar programming models. And ideally, we need to, um, to have more than one because we have different categories of graph applications. So hey, say hello to Jelly. Jelly is the Apache Flink graph API. We have Java and Scala APIs, and we can seamlessly integrate with the Flink dataset API. So you can build really long data processing pipelines where the graph processing is just a step of your, of your program. Jelly has utilities for graph transformations and has a library of common algorithms so you don't have to write them yourself. And, well, you get the taste of the Scala API uh, on the screen. And it, um, it offers several iteration abstractions. So we already have a Pregel abstraction, think like a vertex. We have a signal collect abstraction. We have a gather some apply abstraction. And we have a proof of concept implementation for partition centric um, abstraction. But why Flink? Well, Apache Flink is a very efficient streaming engine. And it has native iteration operators which fit very well for graph applications. And it's very well integrated in the whole big data ecosystem. So you have several connectors to several popular sources. You have connectors to sinks. You can run Flink on the cloud or in containers or, well, wherever you want. Um, so Flink is a very good candidate for this. Now, if you want to know more, all the papers I presented are in the first link. You can learn more about Flink uh, by visiting the, the page, or, uh, and you can learn more about Jelly in the documentation. And finally, if you're into this new wave of streaming, real-time systems, we're building an experimental um, real-time graph processing API for Flink called JellyStream, so you can, you can check it out. Thank you.